Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy, right? I mean, we try to figure out God's will in unique ways. Have you ever used one of these things? Magic eight ball. Remember these things when you were a kid, maybe? Shake it up, ask a question, and see what the magic eight ball says that your future holds. So should the girl in the red shirt start serving at Mosaic? Reply hazy, try again, whatever. God, uh, should everybody at 11 a.m. service in Carl a gift card to Chipotle this week? Ask again later. Sheesh. Magic 8 Ball's hating on me. Guy, if the guy in the last row proposes, will she say yes? It is decidedly so. Congratulations. Um, God, since Kentucky beat my Louisville Cardinals last night, can you have the NCAA bust them for cheating? Very doubtful. God, are my wife and I going to have sex tonight? None of your business. <laughs> Every other service started laughing. You guys were like, what's the answer? <laughs> Last week, we kicked off this series trying to figure out God's will. <laughs> you guys are sick for our lives. We all face situations where we want to figure out what does God want me to do. Or if you're a skeptic, it's even like, yeah, sure, I'd want God's help on some situation, like around my job or family or whatever. Look at our key verse for today. It's Psalm 32, verse 8. Here's what it says. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Now, don't you want that? Don't you want God to guide you along the best pathway for your life? I know I do. The problem is we try to figure out God's will in some wrong ways. So as we get started, I, I want to actually list out what I think are some bad ways that we try to figure out God's will. The first one is we don't ask God. That sounds obvious. Don't ask God. I'm trying to figure out God's will. Why wouldn't I ask God? I don't know, but I don't ask him either. Do you ever have situations like this? Because this is what I do, where I'll have a situation where I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do in this situation. And I'll think about it while I'm falling asleep at night and think, oh, I need to pray about this. I'll pray for about 15 seconds before I'll fall asleep. But then I have a lunch scheduled the next day where I'll talk to somebody for an entire hour hour about it. So the end result is I'm talking to God for 15 seconds about what he wants me to do, and I'm talking to somebody else for an hour. If you don't want to know God's will in your life, don't ask him. That sounds so obvious, but how many of us are trying to For real, figure out, should I have kids? Should I apply for that job? Should I bring up that situation? Should I ask her to marry me? And you haven't asked God. And you're frustrated, but I wonder if God's in heaven saying, hey, you know, I'm here. I'll tell you anytime you want to ask. Another way, bad way of figuring out God's will is rely exclusively on logic. Now, here's the thing. Logic is good. Jesus tells us to love the Lord with our minds. I've taught on uh, from this stage many times. We don't believe in spite of our brains. We believe because of our brains. There's evidence for the resurrection. There's reason to why we believe in God and believe the Bible. Logic is a good thing. But sometimes we believe in logic above all else. And so that doesn't work sometimes because the Christian faith is paradoxical. At times it doesn't make logical sense. The Christian faith. Faith teaches dying is the pathway to life. Purity pays the way to passion. Giving is how you receive. Those things aren't logical if you're trying to figure it out for yourself. Sometimes God's will isn't logical. I follow a nationally known pastor who once had a very large growing church on the West Coast. He was speaker at conferences. I read his books. But he felt God was uh, was telling him, leave your growing huge church I want you to go serve in obscurity in the poorest inner city you can find. That didn't make logical sense at all, but he believed it was God's will for his life. When I was deciding where to go to college, I was accepted to three different colleges, and I realized if I wanted to go into ministry, if I was sure I was going to work in the church one day, there was one college that I should go to. That would give me the best Bible education, the best foundation for ministry. So I decided to go to it, even though it was the worst of the three colleges, When I was making that decision, my mom sat me down, my parents sat me down and said, listen, Carl, we need ministers, but we also need Christian lawyers, and and we need Christian doctors. And I knew what she was saying. Are you sure you want to go to the worst of these three schools? But that's where I went. I should have you know they paid for my education. And the day I graduated, we were standing in my kitchen, and my parents said to me, you know, Carl, we, if we were choosing for you, we wouldn't have had you go to that school, but if we could go back, we wouldn't have chosen anywhere else. 
At the time, it didn't make logical sense to go to the worst of the three colleges, but in retrospect, that respect, that's where God wanted me to go. Sometimes God may want you to do the logical thing. He gives you your brain to, to use it, but relying exclusively on logic is not the path to figure out God's will. You know, I, figure, I, I struggle to figure out God's will for our church a lot. God, should we start Saturday night services? God, who should we hire next? God, who are the best international partners? God, what should we do when we think about space because we're growing and we have this lease for three more years? God, how do we make room for people on Easter when we only have 265 seats? And I don't know the answers to a lot of those questions. And I use logic a lot. But I don't want to rely on logic exclusively. Because if we had relied on logic exclusively, we would never have started this church. What, move to a state where you don't know a single person with just your wife and daughter and start a church? Okay, that'll work out real good. Not logical. Another bad way to figure out God's will is hear what you want to hear. Have you ever had a situation like this where where somebody asks you for advice, you give them your opinion, they go and do the opposite, but they think they're doing what you told them to do. They're think, they think you told them to do what they wanted to do anyway. They're hearing what they wanted to hear. So, for example, maybe you get together with a friend and, and say, how's your love life going? They say, well, you know, I'm interested in this guy and things are going well, and, and what do you think about it? So you share your opinion and then you see him a couple months later and say, hey, how did things ever turn out with that guy? And, and she says, great, our, our relationship's great, we're super serious. And, and you say, I told you not to date that guy. And she says, yeah, you told me to date that guy. And you reply, well, I told you if he got a job, date that guy. And she said, well, you got a job working at Burger King. And you're like, that's not what I meant at all. They're hearing what they want to hear. And sometimes people do this in goofy ways. They just look for goofy signs. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Gideon who God appears to and, and gives him this mission and saying, Gideon, I want you to go do this really difficult mission. Gideon says, well, I'm not sure that was God talking, so God, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lay out a fleece on the ground tonight, and tomorrow morning, if the ground is wet but the fleece is dry, then I'll know it was you that told me that. So sure enough, next morning he gets up, fleece is dry, ground is wet. We're not talking like an Under Armour fleece here. We're talking like wool from a sheep. In case you're cloudy on that. So, but then he says, God, I'm still not sure that was you. That could have been coincidence. So I want to do the opposite. I'm going to put this fleece on the ground. And tomorrow, if the ground is dry, but the fleece is wet, then I'll know it was you that told me to do this crazy thing. Sure enough, next morning, he wakes up, ground is dry, and he can wring out the fleece. So he says, okay, God, I'll do it. But here's the thing with that story. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> I've heard sermons on it that say we should lay out a fleece before the Lord and test him and see what he wants from us. I'm like, I don't know, because one time when I was eight, I read that, and I laid out something outside to see if God would do that, and just do was everywhere. So it didn't really work. I've heard other sermons on that to say, you need to have faith. You shouldn't test God. To be honest, I'm not really sure. What I do know is we do goofy signs. We do goofy things. We say, God, I'm going to call this hot girl. If she answers, I'm going to take that as your will that I should ask her out. And so then on the 11th time you call her in a row, she finally answers, and you think God wants you to date her, but she's going to call and get a restraining order on the next call. You say, God, I'm going to go to the mall. If there's a sale, I'm going to take that as a sign that I should get this dress. And you go, and it says, buy five, get one free. So you say, praise the Lord, I'm getting six dresses, hallelujah. God can use anything and everything. He's God, but a lot of the time we look for goofy signs and we're really just treating God like a magic eight ball. God, should I ask her out? God, should I apply for med school? God, should I keep working at the marriage? God, should we try again to have a kid or should we adopt? And we turn it over and act like this goofy sign must be God's will for our life. See, what happens with all these different things that are bad ways to figure out God's will is we end up frustrated if we can't figure out God's will. We're disappointed if God's will doesn't work out when maybe we didn't really listen to it right in the first place. And we become disillusioned and think, I'll never know God's will. I might as well give up on the whole faith thing altogether when really it was our fault because we weren't really listening to God's will in the first place. So the question is, how do we figure out God's will? What I want to do for the remainder of our time is I want to give you four ways 
to figure out God's will. I want to kind of give you four windows to look through. When you're, when you're looking at God, a decision, a situation, trying to figure out if it's God's will, look through this window, filter it through this window, and see if it's God's will for your life. The first window to look through is what do others say? What do others say? Often in the Bible, when God is communicating his will to someone, he communicates it through other people. It's maybe a friend, maybe a prophet saying, this is what God wants you to do, or this is not what God wants you to do. So this means we need to be around people who are wiser than we are, who are more experienced. One of the primary goals of our growth groups is that when you're in a three-month growth group at Mosaic, you'll make a friend. So when the group is over after three months, that friendship continues so that when you're facing a situation where you're trying to figure out what does God want me to do, what should I do in this situation, you can call that friend and say, hey, what do you think about this? How do we figure out God's will? Second way is God's leading. What the Bible teaches, what we believe as Christians, is that God speaks actively to his people. I want to show you uh, one story of this in the Bible, it's a pretty bizarre story. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. This is crazy. Why would God prevent people from preaching about Jesus? And what does that even mean that the Holy Spirit prevented them from going? That's really all it says about it. I have no idea what that means. But read on. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. That's a crazy story. But what that teaches us is that when you follow Christ, when when you repent, you get God's spirit to live inside you. And you listen to that spirit because God sometimes in crazy, dramatic ways will speak to you and lead you into his will. A third way we listen for what God's will is in our life is we look at our life circumstances. We look at what's going on in our life, who God's placed in our life. And figure out, is God using this scenario, is God using these people to accomplish his will in his life? This is what we talked about last week when we talked about the providential will of God. Even as it relates to Easter, maybe God's been working behind the scenes for decades just so you can invite somebody to have their life changed on Easter. So we know our circumstances. What are your gifts? What are you passionate about? What are you not good at? Who's in your life right now? There's a man in the Bible named Joseph, not the father of Jesus, Joseph, a different Joseph who lived long before that. His brothers sell him into slavery in Egypt, in a different country. But in Egypt, he rises from slavery to become the second most powerful person in the entire country underneath Pharaoh. Then when a famine hits, he saves the entire country from starvation through his wisdom and planning. He's reunited with his brothers, and here's what he says, because they're afraid that he's going to have them killed. Here's what he says. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. He looked at his life circumstances and realized this was the will of God, that God would redeem this horrible situation in my family and use me to save the lives of countless others. So we have others, we have God's leading, we have our life circumstances. Those are all great things and important things. The problem is, if we leave it at that, sometimes it'll leave us frustrated. And we don't know what to do. The time in my life where I was struggling the most to figure out God's will for my life was when we were figuring out, where are we going to start a church? The church I grew up in in Louisville, Kentucky, had hired me with the plan of me being there for a year and then going out somewhere in the northeast United States to start a church that they would help fund. And so we went there and we started doing all these things. We started talking to others and looking at our circumstances and and listening for God's will. We looked at demographic data. We talked to church planning experts. We talked to countless church planners. But this was a weighty decision because if it goes well, we hope this will be the place we spend the rest of our life. If it goes well, this will be the place where we raise our kids. There's a lot of weight on this decision. So one of the things we did in preparation to figure out where we should start a new church was I talked to 
as many other church planners as I could trying to figure out how did you choose where you went. Just called a bunch of other guys. And, and so I talked to one guy who was in Maine, and the church in Kentucky had helped start their church. So I called him up. I said, hey, Scott, tell me how you chose to plant in Maine. He said, well, Carl, we, we did a lot of the same stuff you're doing. We talked to the experts, looked at demographic data. We prayed. We fasted. We asked God, hey, show us where we should go. He said, the first place we came to visit was Maine. We landed at the airport, got our rental car, then drove to a gas station to get directions on how to get where we wanted to go in town. He said, I went off to the corner of the gas station to get some snacks. When I came up to the counter, my wife is standing there next to the female checkout clerk, and they're crying and hugging each other. I said, honey, what's going on? And while he was getting his Diet Coke or whatever, the, his wife had gone up to ask for directions. Before she could even say anything, the woman behind the checkout counter, just to no one in particular, kind of looking down at the counter, just said in frustration, I wish somebody would just start a good church here because I would go to it. <laughs> and the woman said, we're here figuring out if we should start a church. And she said, I'll go to your church. And she said, you're our first member. And then they started crying and hugging right there in the middle of the gas station. So I thought, that's an awesome story. You know, God, well, then I asked, how's it going? Did it work out? He said, Carl, our church is growing like crazy. People who don't go to church are coming here. We're blowing up. We don't have enough room. It, it, it's awesome. So I have this in my back of my mind. I've talked to other church planners with similar stories. And I'm thinking, this is what's going to happen to us. We're going to go to a place. The clouds will part. The sun will shine down. And God, in a Morgan Freeman voice, will say, this is where thou shalt plant. And we will say, yes, Lord, we will obey. So the, we, visited, um, uh, we visited D.C., Providence, Boston, New York, and Baltimore. Baltimore was actually the first area we were visiting, visiting of, the, of that list. And I remember when we landed on the, in the airport, I had a pit in my stomach. Because I'm thinking, God, are you going to talk to us? It's a big decision. This could be where we live the rest of our lives. We had talked to some experts, and they had given us a few different specific places around Baltimore and in the city to look at. One of the places they had recommended was Hunt Valley. They said, this is an up-and-coming area. So we drove up to Hunt Valley. It was lunchtime, so we said, before we drive around anymore, let's go get lunch. We walk into Chipotle, order our food. My wife takes our food and sits down. I take our cups over to the soda machine to get our drinks. I'm thinking of this guy's story from Maine in the back of my head. And I see in front of me in line, there's a young professional. Somebody kind of looks like me. He's wearing his ties on his break from work, whatever. So I think, this is the type of guy I'd want to come to our church. I'm just going to ask him a question. So I went up to him, and I said, hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. I said, uh, we're from out of town. Do you know of any good churches in the area? And he said, no, I don't. But if you start one, I'll go to it. And we started crying and hugging in the middle of Chipotle. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> I went up to him, I said, excuse me, do you know any good churches around here? And he looked at me like I had leprosy, and he goes, no, and he walked away as quick as he could. <laughs> so Lindsay and I talked to people. We looked at our life circumstances. We listened for the leading of God, but we didn't get anything. We didn't know. See, these things alone aren't sufficient. Sometimes others are right. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes it's great to take assessment of your life situation to try to see what God is doing, but sometimes that'll mislead you. Sometimes you can think, maybe God's speaking to me, but then you think, maybe I just had some bad Mexican for dinner last night. How do I know the difference? So how do we figure out God's will for our lives? It is these things, but there's one more window we have to look through. The main window we look through when we're trying to figure out God's will is God's word. God's will is God's word. God's will is God's word. The way he will show you the will of God is by reading the word of God. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. It says this, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to all who come to him for protection. Jesus says that if you build your life on the foundation of his teaching. He says this at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, his most famous teaching. He says, if you build the foundation of your life on this teaching, you will be able to withstand the wind and the rain and the storms of life. Jesus doesn't say you won't have rain or there won't be wind or there won't be a violent storm that enters your life. Following God doesn't mean that everything works out great. 
But God's will is for you to withstand the storm. The storms of life, the storms of your own sin, whatever that is. How do you do that? You base your life on the Word of God. Some of you right now are in a storm. You're in pain. When we sang in the first song, the oceans are raging, you're thinking, yes, they are all around me. You're not sure sure how you're going to get through what you're facing. But God wants you to know, he promises he will be a shield for for, for your protection. So stand on the promises of his word. If you cry out to him, he'll answer. If He will give you hope. He will give you grace. Because every word of God proves true. Here's what he says in Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. If you are in the dark about where you need to go to follow God, open the Bible. His word will light your path. Joshua 1, 9. This is my command. This is God speaking to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, I'm not, I'm not a tattoo guy. I don't have any tattoos. I know some of you are like trying to fill up your whole arm or something. If I was going to get a tattoo, this is the verse it would be. This verse is awesome. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. God's with you. Some of you are writing that down like, yes, get tattoo of Joshua 1.9. But look at the reason for it in the previous verse. Here's what God says to him. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it, Joshua, day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. He says, be strong, be courageous. God's with you. How do I do that, God? Meditate on my law. Keep it with you every day the rest of your life. See, God wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. He wants to set you free. His word exists to set you free. So many of us look at the Bible as a list of rules, but it's a handbook on how to free, live freely. God doesn't want to constrain you. He wants to set you free. When I tell my kids, don't stick a screwdriver in the outlet, that's not constrain them. That's a rule to set them free so they don't get shocked, so they don't go to the hospital. James 1 says this, but if you look into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. God's will is God's word. So read it. Get it emailed to you. Talk to other people about it. Find creative ways to keep God's word, the Bible, in front of you. In our house, we got a a chalkboard wall in our our kitchen. My wife just painted us uh, one wall with chalkboard paint. And every week when our kids come home from Mosaic with the the papers from their kids' classes, it has their memory verse on there. Every week, she writes it on the chalkboard wall. So every meal, every day, every week, we have God's Word in front of our family. Find ways to get God's Word in you. God's will is God's Word. The reality is the most important application some of you are going to get from this entire series is simply a recommitment to being God's Word every single day. And if you don't know where to start, I'd start in the Gospel of Luke. Read a chapter every day. But listen, if you say you want to know the will of God, but you're not reading the word of God, I'd argue you don't really want to know God's will. God's will is God's word. Now, there's kind of a deeper meaning to this as well. Here it is. Know who is God's word. Know who is God's word. God's word, that phrase has two meanings In Scripture, first, it refers to the teaching of Jesus, the laws of God, the Bible. But second, it refers to Jesus himself. Look at John chapter 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. What does that mean? Before the creation of the world, there wasn't a Bible. It's talking about Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. God created everything through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. So the Word is Jesus. God's will 
is God's Word. So what we do is when we look at this, we don't just look at these three things, we look at them through the lens of God's Word. So I listen to others, but I look at it through the Bible and Jesus. I follow God's leading, and I filter that through my relationship with Christ. I look at my life circumstances and take account of those, but I will view those in light of my walk with Christ and what He's teaching me in the Bible. God's will is God's Word. If you want to know God's will, sell out to Jesus Christ. Know Jesus Christ, study him in his word, develop a relationship with him daily. Following Jesus Christ is God's ultimate will for your life. Then once you're walking with Christ, when you face a small situation, however big or small it may seem to you, you look at it through the lens of your walk with Christ and you figure that out. Look at these scriptures. These are all explicit scriptures on what God's will is. John 6, 40. For it is my Father's will, says Jesus, that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. 2 Peter 3, 9. God does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Well, I don't know if I could follow a God who just throws people into hell. He wants you to repent. 1 Timothy 2, 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. God's will is that you have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So here's the application that I hope sets some of you free. If you are walking with Jesus Christ, you're in God's will. If you're walking with Jesus Christ, you are in God's will. I hope this is setting some of you free from the burdens you're picking up and carrying. Some of you stress out about decisions and figuring out God's will, but following Christ is his will. If you don't know Christ, you can't know God's will. If you are in Christ, you are in his will. God, what college should I go to? God is much more concerned with how you pursue purity at whatever college you attend than what school colors you wear. Follow Christ. God, should I take that job? God is much more concerned that you're thankful for whatever job you have than who signs your paycheck. Follow Christ. God, should I buy this house or that house? God is much more concerned with who is the spiritual foundation of your family than what zip code is on your address. Follow Christ. I hope some of you are getting free because we have this tendency to say, I'm only human. I can't figure out. I'm stressing out about figuring out God's will. But God does not want you to stress out about that. Here's what he says to you in Proverbs 10, The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Listen, that verse is more than about money. God wants to bless you with peace. He wants to bless you with joy. He doesn't want you to stress out about materialistic things that don't have eternal significance. And the blessing of the Lord doesn't bring sorrow with it. I hope the next time you're facing a big decision that if God doesn't give you clear direction, that as long as you're following him, you realize probably both paths are fine. Here's what I know. I know it's God's will for you to be saved. If you're running from God, if you gave up on God because he gave up on you, or if you're just doing the too cool thing, like, yeah, sure, I live for Jesus, but I'm just, I'm just going to do my own thing. Too cool to really sell out. God's will is for you to turn to him, to quit being too cool, to quit doing it on your own, and he'll give you freedom. To those of you trying to figure out God's will, are you sold out for Jesus Christ? Not like, yeah, I'm good with God, we're cool, and then move on. That's not what we're talking about. Are you consumed with pursuing the one who gave his life for you? We're going to take a moment to celebrate communion, to celebrate the one who gave his life for us. The band's going to play some music in a minute, and when they do, a tray's going to be passed down your row. We want you to take a stack of two cups. It has a cracker and some juice representing the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And then as the band plays, you can eat and drink that any time. So my wife and I visited a bunch of cities trying to figure out where does God want us to go? And the clouds never parted, the sun never shone down, Morgan Freeman never talked to us and told us this is the city we were supposed to go. So 
We spend a lot of nights just laying in bed awake at night talking. Have you heard from God? No. I fasted today. I didn't hear from God either. Have you talked to some more people? Yeah, but I still don't know. For a variety of reasons, we got it narrowed down to two things where we thought we should either go to Manhattan or go to suburban Baltimore. And at the end of the day, we thought, you know, both places would be good. We could go to either place, and we think God would be pleased with us. Both places need another Bible-believing church. Both places we think we'd be able to raise money. We'd have fun in both places. But for a variety of reasons, including just simply we had grown up in the suburbs, and we thought maybe we'll just be more effective in what we've grown up in. We decided let's give Maryland a shot and see what happens. But there are a lot of times in the first few years where I wondered, Do we miss God's will? We were trying to get a launch team of 40 people to help us launch this church. I remember about the third or fourth launch team meeting in my living room that was just six weeks before we were set to launch in the movie theater. We had 10 people show up, and I thought, God, did we miss it? In those early days, Ben Austin would stand down front in the movie theater, and he'd say, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mosaic. I'd be in the front row, so I'd, oh, everybody, let me turn around and see. There'd be three people there. I'd think, wow. Wow. You know, we often had 80, 85 people, including kids, including volunteers, for a whole service. And I thought, God, did we miss it? Is this going to work? I remember going six months before we had our first baptism and thinking and praying and kind of getting mad at God, saying, God, we came here because we want to reach people who don't go to church, who don't have a walk with Christ yet. Did we miss it? It took a couple years before I realized we had it. If you're here for our Christmas Eve service, you probably remember in the last song our band was just rocking it out it was a great moment and on the screens there were these still pictures of most of the people who'd been baptized in 2013 it was a really moving moment Uh, my wife and I were sitting down here on the first row and and I hadn't told her what was coming you know I we'd planned all this stuff out for Christmas Eve but I just wanted her to experience it so I kind of look out of the corner of my eye at her and she's getting choked up her eyes are watering a little bit when she's looking at those baptisms And I had a realization in that moment. I leaned over, I put my arm around her, and I whispered in her ear, that's why we moved here. And she just lost it. Listen, when you follow Christ, you will leave in your wake a path of changed lives. And you'll be able to say, that's why I follow Christ. Join the great mission God has called us to of changing this generation forever. If you've been holding out because you're too prideful, too arrogant, or too cool, give up. Let your life be another story that he's changed here at Mosaic. Psalm 32 says this. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. That's what I want. God's will is God's word. So let's follow Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to follow your will. We do. God, there's people in here who are facing big decisions. What school to choose? Should they try one last time at reconciling that relationship? What should they try to do with their kids? How should they face this sickness? God, those can stress us out if we're not careful. And they do carry a significant weight. God, if you need to speak, speak clearly. But God, I pray that we will be a church that follows you so closely, that is so consumed by you and so aware of the peace you grant us that if you don't speak clearly on which path to take, we will take that as a sign that we can take either path and as long as we're doing it with the ultimate hope of honoring Christ, then we can have a peace that, no, we are completely in your will. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.